and today we're looking at the true meaning of Halloween. And you might wonder what that's got to do with the Bible. Well, we hope to show that shortly. So where are we going by way of this talk? Well, these are all the topics that we would like to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, looking at what Halloween is like today and also the background. But included in it, in it we're going to be considering um, what the word hallowed means, who the saints are, um, what All Saints Day is, and so on. And, and concluding towards the end then, asking that vital question, will you be a saint? So today we have all these different celebrations, perhaps not quite as many this year with COVID as we would have had last year and the year before. And of course, a lot of these appear to have come from uh, America, but uh, they've been around for a very long time, as we shall see. So the date is the 31st of October, it's an annual event, and uh, I'm sure children especially are looking forward to it, but more adults as well are making the most of these celebrations um, by way of uh, uh, sort of a, a something different to do. So, the historical background. Well, the word Halloween actually means hallowed evening or holy evening, and it comes from a term for All Hallows' Eve, All Hallows' Day, the day before. And over time, All Hallows' Eve or evening evolved into the word that we have today, Halloween. And although that phrase, All Hallows, is found in Old English, um, it didn't really appear into the year 1556. But historically, we can actually go back even further than that. So the Celtic origin of this feast, this festival, uh, goes back to Celtic mythology um, with uh, this term, Samhain. Uh, and it dates back 2,000 years ago to the ancient Celts. And it means summer's end. And they believe that summer ended on the 30th, 31st of October and the new year began on the 1st of November. And the Celts followed a, a lunar calendar and their celebrations therefore began at sunset on the night before. And those celebrations included all families engaging in a, a good clean out on that, that particular day clearing out the old to make way for the new. So, at sunset on the 31st of October, the local villagers would all meet and formal celebrations of Samhain would begin by lighting a giant bonfire. And, and perhaps this too has, has come into our culture with uh, the burning of uh, Guy Fawkes on the 5th of November, but it actually was a, a fire celebration that began on the 31st of October and they would burn crops and animals as sacrifices to the Celtic gods. But during those celebrations, the Celts would also wear different costumes and they would dance around the bonfire. And many of them told stories or played out the cycle of life from life and death. Uh, and those costumes were really for three primary reasons. Firstly, to signify that the souls of the dead would be set free from the land of the dead into a physical world during the evening of Samhain. And there was a fear that some of those souls would destroy crops, hide livestock or haunt the living who may have done them wrong. And so the costumes were intended to hide from these bad spirits to escape their trickery. And finally, it was to honour the Celtic gods who had assisted the village or clan through the trials and tribulations of the previous year and to ask for favour or treats during the coming year and the harsh winter that was approaching. So those three points, haunting, trickery and favour, is what's come into our, our lives uh, in recent years with the trick-or-treating um, and the haunting and the ghosts and so on that people play at. And when the celebration was over, each of those families would take a torch from the bonfire and return to their own homes and the home fires that had been put out, extinguished during the day, were relit with a flame from this sacred bonfire to help protect its inhabitants during the coming winter months. And fires were kept burning night and day during those months, and the families would place food or drink outside their doors, and that was done to appease the roaming spirits who might play tricks on the family. But by AD 43, the Romans had succeeded in conquering the Celtic lands, and they ruled for around 400 years, and they combined many of those ancient Celtic tradition celebrations with their own traditions and celebrations. So two in particular, two Roman holidays were merged with Samhain. The first is Feralia, 
a day in late October when the Romans traditionally celebrated the passing of the dead. And the second is Pomona's Day, a day when the Roman goddess of Pomona was honored. She was the goddess of fruit and trees. And that symbol of Pomona is the apple and the incorporation of this celebration into Sawain probably explains the tradition of bobbing for apples practiced in Halloween today. With the coming of Christianity in the 800s AD, the early church in England tried to Christianize the old Celtic festivals. And it was Pope Boniface IV who designated that the 1st of November should be All Saints Day, honoring saints and martyrs. He also decreed the 31st of October as All Hallows Eve, All Saints Evening. And scholars today widely accept that the Pope was attempting to replace earlier Celtic pagan festivals and traditions with a church sanctioned holiday. And as this Christian holiday spread, the name evolved as well, also called All Hallows Eve or All Hallow Mass, meaning All Saints Day. 200 years later, in 1000 AD, the church made the 2nd of November All Souls Day, a day to honour the dead. And it celebrated similar to Sawain with a big bonfire, parades, dressing up, costumes such as saints, angels and devils. And together those three celebrations, that triune holiday, the Eve of All Saints, All Saints and All Souls Day, were called Hallow Mass. And during those celebrations, those festivities, poor citizens would beg for food and families would give them pastries called soul cakes in return for their promise to pray for the family's dead relatives. And the distribution of those soul cakes was to encourage, was encouraged by the church as a way to replace the ancient practice of leaving food and wine for roaming spirits, as was the Celtic practice. And that practice, which was referred to as going a souling, and it was eventually taken up by children who would visit the houses in their neighbourhood and be given ale, food and money. A little bit different to the, the money or treats that uh, are given out these days. Well, let's think about this word hallowed. It's a word that we might be familiar with from the Lord's Prayer, to hallow or to make holy or sacred, to sanctify or consecrate or venerate. And it's uh, the adjective form hallowed is used in the Lord's Prayer, means holy, consecrated, sacred or sanctified. And the noun form hallow is a synonym of the word saint. And in Middle English, the old French saint, from the Latin sanctus, holy, past possible, participle of sanctir, or concentrate, consecrate, like to, to sanctify. So who are saints? Well, the label saint is used in the established church for people who have entered God's presence in heaven and who can provide benefits to humanity when petitioners pray to them. And it's argued that there are more saints on, than are recorded on the official canonical list. But what does the Bible say? That's what we're really interested in. Does the Bible say uh, that there are saints in heaven that we should pray to? Well, in John 3, 13, we're told that no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. So quite clearly it says there are no saints in heaven, just the Lord Jesus Christ. And who then should we pray to? Well, Timothy tells us, Paul writing to Timothy in his first letter in the second chapter and the fifth verse, says that there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there are no saints to, to pray to. We are, should pray to the Lord Jesus Christ or through the Lord Jesus Christ. Who then are saints? Well, the practice of adopting a patron saint goes back to the building of the first public churches in the Roman Empire. And most of those were built over the graves of martyrs. And the churches were then given the name of the martyr. And the martyr was expected to act as an intercessor for the Christians who worshipped there. Soon, Christians began to dedicate churches to other men and women, who they called saints, even though they weren't martyred for their beliefs. And today, some relic of a saint is placed inside the altar of each church, and that church is dedicated to a patron or patrons. And that's what it means to say that church is St. Mary's or St. Peter's or St. Paul's. 
You might think about Mumbles. Um, we have All Saints Church in Oystermouth, and, and that seems to have been taken perhaps from All Saints Day, uh, where all saints are remembered. But the word saint literally means holy or separate. And in the New Testament, saints are living people who believed in Jesus and who followed his teachings. And Paul often addresses his epistle to the saints of a city. For example, in Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Again in Corinthians, to all the saints which are in all Achaia. So these are living people that he is writing to, people who have been called out, separated to become Christians. So those who followed Jesus had been so transformed that they were now different from other men and women and thus should be considered holy or separate. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So when will All the Saints Day be, the real All Saints Day? Well, Jesus answered Martha and said that, Jesus, that Lazarus would rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again. When? In the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Yet shall he live in the resurrection on the last day. Behold, I tell you a mystery, says Paul, right into the Corinthians again. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. And many of us may be familiar with this passage from funerals we may have attended. But it wasn't just a New Testament teaching. Look at this passage in Daniel chapter 12. At that time shall arise Michael, and at that time your people will be delivered, everyone whose names shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. At that time, at the time of resurrection, is what he's talking about. And those whose names are found written in the book. Not everyone who ever lived will be raised. Those whose names are written. And many, not all, many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And there will be a judgment. Some will receive everlasting life, and some will be condemned to shame and everlasting contempt. And this is the will of him who sent me, says Jesus, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me, says Jesus, unless the Father who sent, him, sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's when the real All Saints Day will be, when Jesus raises us up on that last day. And we believe that we're living in the eve, the evening, just prior to that day of resurrection. That day of resurrection cannot be far away. Daniel, again in the 12th chapter, warns that at that time, when Michael arises, there will be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. And we are certainly living in troublous times when leaders of nations don't know which way to turn to solve the problem of this world. Not just wars any longer, but also pestilence and famine and fire and flood and when we think about what's happening with COVID-19, hardly surprising that we are living in the last days, a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation. And Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
and dead will appear in heaven, the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When it's talking about there, the signs in the sun, moon, and stars, it's talking about leaders of nations and how those leaders of nations and those powers will be shaken and will fall. And then Jesus will appear with power and great glory. Peter, in writing his letter, says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just note these things. What should we be like? And what effort should we be making? And should we celebrate Halloween? What do you think? It's a it's a quite a, a funny time, it's quite a hilarious time, it's quite a fun time to to celebrate that sort of should we not celebrate it? Well, we found that it originated in pagan festivals. So should we be celebrating pagan festival things? And yet it was Christianized by the Catholic Church. And yet even that was based on unscriptural teaching. It was more to do with getting the pagans to join the church than it was to be celebrating anything in particular. And so no, we shouldn't celebrate it as a religious festival on pagan terms or on Christian terms. But is there any harm in entering into the fun of a cultural and traditional celebration? Well, that's a matter of individual conscience. But what is certain is that it doesn't have any scriptural basis. Rather, if you want to be a saint, and if you want to celebrate or be celebrated in the real saint's day, look at this passage in Hebrews. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, for good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So there have always been people who have twisted and perverted the truth of the gospel. What else does Paul say in writing to the Hebrews? Let us, therefore, strive to enter into that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Through the word of God, God knows what we're thinking and what our lives are really like, and whether we are fit to be one of those saints to be raised in the last day and enter into that kingdom of God on the earth. No creature is hidden from God's sight. We are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So will you be a saint? Since we've got a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We don't pray to people that have died who have been martyred for what they believed we pray through our great high priest the lord jesus christ let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need so thank you for listening to that i i hope you found that interesting and if you want to know more about what the christadelphians believe then there is a free bible reading planner to help you read your bible and there's a booklet that is called Life's Biggest Questions. Just email us at mumblesecclesia at gmail.com or follow us on